Father, we thank you for this day. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Doubt storms. There is a window in your heart through which you can see God. Once upon a time that window was clear. Your view of God was crisp. You could see God as vividly as you could see a gentle valley or hillside. The glass was clean, see, the pain unbroken. You knew God, you knew how he worked, you knew what he wanted you to do. No surprises, nothing unexpected. You knew that God had a will and you continually discovered what it was. Then suddenly, the window cracked. A pebble broke the window, a pebble of pain. Perhaps the stone struck when you were a child and a parent left home forever. Maybe the rock hit in adolescence when your heart was broken. Maybe you made it into adulthood before the window was cracked. But then the pebble came. Was it a phone call? We have your daughter at the station, you better come down. Was it a letter on the kitchen table? I've left, don't try to reach me, don't try to call me, it's over. I just don't love you anymore. Was it a diagnosis from the doctor? I'm afraid our news is not very good. Was it a telegram? We regret to inform you that your son is missing in action. Whatever the pebbles form, the result was the same, a shadowed, shattered window. The pebble missiled into the pain and shattered it, see. The crash echoed down the halls of your heart. Cracks shot out from the point of impact, creating a spider web of fragmented pieces, see. And suddenly God was not so easy to see anymore. The view that had been so crisp had changed. You turned to see God and his figure was rather distorted. It was hard to see him through the pain. It was hard to see him through the fragments of hurt. See, you were puzzled. God wouldn't allow something like this to happen, would he? Tragedy and travesty weren't on the agenda of the one you had seen, were they? Had you been fooled? Had you been blind? The moment the pebble struck, the glass became a reference point for you. From then on, there was life before the pain and life after the pain. Before the pain, the view was clear. God seemed so near. After your pain, well, he, he was harder to see. He seemed a bit distant, harder to perceive. Your pain distorted the view, not eclipsed it, but distorted it. Maybe these words don't describe your situation. There are some people who never have to redefine or refocus their view of God. Most of us do, though. Most of us know what it means to feel disappointed by God. Most of us have a way of completing this sentence. If God is God, then call it an agenda. Call it a divine job description. Each of us has an unspoken yet definitive explanation of what God should do. If God is God, then there will be no financial collapse in my family. If God is God, my children will never be buried before me. If God is God, people will treat me fairly. If God is God, this church will never divide. If God is God, my prayer will be answered. These are not articulated criteria. They are not written down or notarized, but they are real. They define the expectations we have of God. And when pain comes into our world, 
When the careening pebble splinters the window of our hearts, these expectations go unmet and doubts may begin to surface. See, we look for God, but we can't find him. Fragmented glass hinders our vision. He is enlarged through this piece and reduced through that one. See, lines jigsaw their way across his face. Large sections of shattered glass opaque the view. See, and now you aren't quite sure what you see. The disciples weren't sure what they saw either. Jesus failed to meet their expectations. The day Jesus fed the 5,000 men, he didn't do what they wanted him to do. Follow me here. The 12 returned from their mission, followed by an army. They finished their training. They recruited the soldiers. They were ready for battle. They expected Jesus to let the crowds crown him as king and attack the city of Herod. They expected battle plans, strategies, a new era for Israel. What did they get? Just the opposite. Instead of weapons, they got oars. Rather than being sent to fight, they were sent to float. The crowds were sent away. Jesus walked away and they were left on the water with a storm brewing in the sky. What kind of Messiah would do this? Can you hear them? Note carefully the sequence of the stormy evening as Matthew records it. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him on the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now Matthew is specific about the order of events. Jesus sent the disciples to the boat. Then he dismissed the crowd and ascended a mountainside. It was evening, probably around 6 p.m. The storm struck immediately. The sun had scarcely set before typhoon-like winds began to roar. Note that Jesus sent the disciples out into the storm alone. Even as he was ascending the mountainside, he could feel and hear the gale force winds. Jesus was not ignorant of the storm. He was aware that a torrent was coming that would carpet bomb the sea's surface. But he didn't turn around. The disciples were left to face the storm alone. The greatest storm that night was not in the sky, however. It was in the disciples' hearts. The greatest fear was not from seeing the storm-driven waves. It came from seeing the back of their leader as he left them to face the night with only questions as companions. It was this fury that the disciples were facing that that night, it was this fury that the disciples were facing that night. Listen, imagine the incredible strain of bouncing from wave to wave in a tiny fishing vessel. One hour would weary you, two hours would exhaust you. Surely Jesus will help us, they thought. They'd seen him still storms like this one before on this same sea, see. They had awakened, listen, they had awakened him during a storm once, remember, and he had commanded the skies to be silent. They'd seen him quiet the wind and soothe the waves. Surely he will come off the mountain, but he doesn't. Their arms begin to ache from rowing. Still no sign of Jesus. Three hours, four hours, the winds rage, the boat bounces, still no Jesus. Midnight comes, their eyes search for God in vain. By now the disciples have been on the sea for as long as six hours. All this time they had fought the storm and sought the master. And so far the storm is winning and the master is nowhere to be found. 
Where is he? cried one. Has he forgotten us? yells another. He feeds thousands of strangers and yet leaves us to die, muttered a third. I imagine this was the conversation on the boat. The Gospel of Mark adds compelling insight into the disciples' attitudes. They had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. What does Mark mean? Simply this. The disciples were mad. They began the evening in a huff. Their hearts were hardened toward Jesus because he fed the multitude. Their preference, remember, had been to send the crowds away. And Jesus had told them to feed the people, but they wouldn't try. They said it couldn't be done. They told Jesus to let the people take care of themselves. Also, keep in mind that the disciples had just spent some time on center stage themselves. In other words, they had tasted stardom. They were celebrities. They had rallied crowds. They had recruited an army. They were no doubt pretty proud of themselves. With chest a bit puffy and heads a bit swollen, they told Jesus what to do. Just send them away. Jesus didn't. Instead, he chose to bypass the reluctant disciples and use the faith of an ooh, anonymous boy. What the disciples said couldn't be done, was done in spite of them, not through them. They pouted, they sulked. Rather than being amazed at the miracle, they became mad at the master. After all, they had felt foolish passing out the very bread they said could not be made. Add to that Jesus' command, Jesus' command to go to the boat when they wanted to go to battle. And it's easier to understand why these guys are burning up. Now, what is Jesus up to leaving us out on this sea, on this night, on a night like this? It's 1 a.m., no Jesus. It's 2 a.m., no Jesus. Peter, Andrew, James, and John have seen storms like this. They are fishermen. The sea is their life. They know the havoc the gale force winds can wreak. They've seen the splintered hulls float to shore. They've attended the funerals. They know better than anyone that this night could be their last. Why doesn't he come? They sputter. Why doesn't he come? Finally, he does. During the fourth watch of the night, that's about 3 o'clock to 6 a.m. in the morning, Jesus went to them, walking on the lake, walking on the lake. 